For the genesis of anything, the first necessity is the formation of a proper milieu. This is brought about by spiritual influence. For if you have not in yourself the will to the light, you are like a magnet which has lost its magnetism, or a bird which has lost its wings, unable to move and obliged to submit passively to the laws of its environment. If you desire liberation, you must become your own milieu and bring forth your own light, completing your cycle in yourself. But this cycle must genuinely correspond to your original destiny. If you wish to bring forth the divine light of wisdom, do not provide for it the unstable milieu of your maladjusted personality, and beware what powers you attract by your desires and prayers. How few are those who can draw down the divine power directly and simply, without formulas and names, in spirit and in truth. They are the true poor in spirit, who desire in truth, and theirs is the only desire that deserves to be so called, for it yearns only for that, lives for that, unites itself to that, just as a flower drinks its life from the light. For this desire is in them a vital necessity, and the necessity is that of their own divine spark, demanding its sustenance. For such, the kingdom of heaven is indeed within them, because they are in it. For that which is not separated is one, and this desire is non-separation. The obstructions to this desire are all those things that men call desires, the desires of the earthly are attached to all that is not that, because that, the spirit, seems to them the void, and men fear the void. So to escape it they listen to all their desires, and these desires are not the desire, but either wishes which are mental, or else affinities created by the need for finding one's complement. Thus is nature's work continued, and this is the kingdom of earth. Many are those who project their imaginings outside themselves and create gods in their own image and likeness. The powers they would adore are those that can grant them all the boons they yearn for in this world and the next. They are answered by Christ's word, Ye know not what ye ask. Their wish is for an idol to protect and favor them, or else for a divine being who can be loved possessively. But paradises, like gods, are made by men according to their desires, and their misfortune will be that they will often find what they have imagined. But what we can imagine is no part of the inexpressible, divine. An omnipresent desire is one which animates the very cells of your being, and makes you able to seize and grasp the object of your affinity. Such a desire has magic power, and, like the sorcerer's apprentice, man uses it imprudently. For the god or power which answers him is of the same nature as his desire. The money-grubber invokes the powers of money, the social climber the powers of the social order, and the thinker invokes intellectual powers. Thus the seeker is ruled and restricted by his affinity. This is hell, or purgatory in which he is already confined in this present life. As for so-called spiritual desires, the potency of the desire must not be confused with these anemic wishes for spirituality or emotional longings toward some god or other who is expected to reciprocate, to show some good intentions, and to provide all the scenic effects which lull the pious into an illusion of beatitude. What do I gain if I deceive myself? Only my mortal being can be deceived. When the illusory vanishes, reality appears. The necessary experience is to recognize the real in the midst of the world of illusion. To do this I must clear my own ground, eliminate all that is not my true self, and create in myself the milieu which can attract the spirit. 
Only the immortal self can eliminate personal desires, and so serve the one true desire, desire for the eternal, and then the permanent witness will submit without reserve to the supremacy of the spiritual witness. The milieu is that wherein the complementary opposites meet and are adjusted together. The means is that which brings them together, and this means, this possibility of concord, is the knowledge of how to create a harmonious milieu. Every milieu that is pure and ripe to receive seed will easily bear the fruit of its own king. Purity, however, does not consist in the absence of dirt, physical or moral, as the world erroneously thinks. The purity of a thing is its homogeneousness, in accordance with its own particular type. A man is perfectly pure at whatever moment he is totally identified with the cosmic character of his being. A scorpion, too, can be perfectly pure, and is so in so far as it is perfectly true to its nature. Any concession that weakens the essential rhythm of a being puts it into a heterogeneous and therefore impure condition. For, as Hippocrates said, the homogeneous will join with the homogeneous, but the heterogeneous fights, resists, and separates. Thus any mixture of blood or of divergent tendencies creates a battlefield, and equally the forced creation of a milieu for some arbitrary ideal or for qualities foreign to its nature can only give birth to monsters and be a source of needless strife. If the fruit is to be sound, the milieu must be in harmony with the nature of the seed. Thus, for the creation of such a milieu in oneself, the first requisite is a knowledge of all the deepest tendencies of one's real being. The second condition is to awaken and re-educate the inner perceptions. The third is to cultivate and intensify the will to the light. Seeking Out Tendencies If in the revealing light of some moment of cataclysm you were to meet your double, not dressed in its worldly glad rags, not armed with that buckler of excuses which conventional hypocrisy uses to cover our secret wishes, but in all its moral nakedness, showing its tendencies and urges, its pitiless cunning and its cowardice, are you certain that you would recognize it? How many sages are there on this earth who could, and calmly would, call by their real names the secret motives of their actions? That, nevertheless, would be the greatest victory a man could gain over himself, and the first proof of his mastery, a clear vision of all the tendencies which rule his inner being. If you want to enjoy the sympathy of the crowd, if you want normal people to make excuses for you, do not enter the maze to which this fearless search will lead you. Remain in the disguising shade, where reassuring mediocrity comes down and veils any truth that should threaten to show its face, and, to discourage inquiries, covers it with a well-known label. For quite possibly the unveiling of your secret world might ruffle your calm acceptance of the opinions, values, and prejudices which rule your ordinary life. But if your aim is to attain masterhood and knowledge, then illuminate one day of your life with the cold light of impersonal judgment, observe the finer points of all your impulses, excavate without pity and without excuses, until you lay bare their roots and origins. You will be surprised at times, to recognize the signature of your ancestors in certain atavistic ways of behavior, learned or inherited from your family. Other impulses to which you have given moral value without examining their right to it will be shown up as mere habitual reflexes of mind or emotion, impressed upon you either by education or by the daily suggestion of your religious and social circumstances. Both these classes of impulse are foreign to you, 
and prevent your true nature from manifesting itself. A third class is your own. Observe it, therefore, but do not judge it. It consists of passionate impulses, marks of your deepest nature, which can reveal to you by their analogies with the same forces in nature, in planets, animals, plants, and metals, the characteristics of your true being, and help you to identify yourself with it. Let us make a beginning together on this introspection. The atavistic tendencies which are the signature of a family or a race are the rhythm or type imprinted by contagion, and as it were by a sort of imitation, on all the cells of the body and all the corpuscles of the blood. And the blood, as vehicle of this animal soul, transfuses its characteristics and superficial tendencies from generation to generation until they are effaced by new impressions. This effect will be the deeper, the narrower is the circle in which the family or race is living. The confirmations of family character, though they may be brought out or hidden by relationships with the world outside, have been ingrained by successive generations and cannot be removed except by length of time or violent rupture. Emigrants, transplanted into a race and tradition radically different from their own, often show greater flexibility of habit and judgment, and are often readier for the acceptance of new ideas. One who looks indulgently on the violent temper he has inherited, or smiles to recognize in his mirror some gesture familiar in his grandfather or father, should rather try to break these chains of servitude and give attention to the grand object of his journey. For the great mass of humans, family, country, and religious denomination are an indispensable refuge. But for those who desire to take the narrow way and attain the highest of human possibilities, the gospel has shown the unconditional requirement. If any man hate not his father and mother and wife and children, he cannot be my disciple. The word hate does not mean in the gospel of love, that fury which poisons modern society, but rather the exclusiveness which gives precedence to the conquest of reality, over against all other social duties and relationships. Here again the choice should be made wholeheartedly. If you are still attached to the fetters of memory, if you are still controlled by the instinct for continuation on earth, then you had better submissively accept the duties of your chosen world, support its customs and traditions, even to excess, and observe them so intensely and so consciously that by contrast your sense of eternity will be awakened and will summon you in the more sacred duty of the individual quest. But if this longing for reality predominates already in you, then follow the commandments of liberation. Let go of all that past as written in your substance. Seek your true name. Set yourself apart from the group soul of any group, and learn that you can serve your fellow travelers more effectively by becoming, yourself, a sun that shines with its own light, rather than by helping them to drag the old chains of slavery. The same applies to the tendencies engraved upon yourselves, by the education you were obliged to undergo. Since your life began, all your intellectual reflexes, all your manner of judging things and of expressing your feelings, were carved and molded by the wills of others, and inhibited by the development of your individual consciousness. Now you can free it from this dead weight, knock down the wall of prohibitions and prejudices, which prevented you from making your own discoveries. What do you know of good and evil? Their relative value varies from one race or climate to another, and their absolute value you can only learn by identifying yourself with the source of all things. But in order to do this, you must let go of all preconceived opinions, all judgments dictated by convenience, all the conventions necessary to social life. 
Many so-called sins will hardly weigh as such in the cosmic balance, but many acts ostensibly innocent will lay upon you a heavy burden of karma. Granted that you incur a debt toward anyone whom you injure by the refusal to discharge an acknowledged duty, granted that you are responsible when you break the laws of the social order, granted, too, that you have duties to your family, but only to the extent that you have freely accepted them, and for this reason the obligations of marriage and parenthood are more binding than those of filial or fraternal duties. But a duty in the general interest will always be more important than others, and the first of all these is the duty to make spiritual growth, for one wise action by a man of insight can do more for humanity than a whole life of conventional virtue. Whoever gives his free consent to being a member of a group is bound thereby to accept its earthly rules and sanctions. But no group, not even a religious group, can have a right to thwart the evolution of an individual either by overruling his conscience or by professing to substitute for the judgment of his own true destiny its own allegedly eternal condemnation, or by granting a pardon which in the absence of true contrition is ineffective. For the attainment of the suprahuman realm there are certain inexorable requirements, and there can be no excuses, no sentimental concessions to the relative values of the merely human world. For, as the Christ said, I pray not for the world. Thus duty can take strange forms when its motive is the sublime quest for the light. For example, the obligation on certain Chinese dynasties to destroy the works of their predecessors in order to rebuild in a new spirit. So too certain revolutionary schools of art and the destructive tendencies of such notions as permanent revolution, ill-expressed today by social theories based on perverted intuitions. All these bear witness to that urge we have to destroy impermanent values, and in the shock of the void, to discover the true light. It is of course unwise to trust the unawakened with means of destruction, which only the sage should wield. Yet no one of the elect will find his kingdom, except by the pitiless destruction of everything which is not a part of the indestructible life of his own being. And this can only be the consciousness developed in him by the experience of life. Blind obedience is for the herd, and mediocrity is its refuge. A boldness that accepts its responsibility is the virtue of the conqueror who would find the keys of his kingdom. Happy is he who dares to destroy the phantoms of his past in order to find his own eternal likeness. Thrice happy he who is in love with the void, who fears not to plunge into the abyss where creative faith can lose nothing but its shadow, and the living soul nothing but its dead ghost. You who do not wish to die with your body, cut out and cast in the fire, from among your habits and ideas, all that can be destroyed. The indestructible will reveal itself of itself. Your deep, your passionate tendencies are tyrannical forces linked to your destiny, just as the need to sing is linked to the throat of the nightingale. Your needs are elementary forces born of the necessity for a physical organ to discharge its function. The stomach lives to eat, and to do this it forms juices which attack its food. But if food fails, these acids attack its own substance, and it creates a feeling of pain, which is a cry for help. The pain becomes a sensation of tyrannical necessity, and obliges the animal to kill in order to satisfy it. From bacteria, the most primitive form of stomach, up to the human animal, this urge expresses itself more and more perfectly. But whether it teaches ambush to the spider, cunning to the fox, or violence to the carnivore, it is still the same obedience to an elementary need. 
In an organic being, each vital function is the expression of a corresponding need. But the different needs express themselves with different rhythms, in a subtle or gross manner, according to the stage of evolution of the individual and the species. In the lion, voracity is held back for a few moments by pride of conquest, and in the cat by its love of play. Where delicacy of perception goes hand in hand with the development of consciousness, its modes of expression can be distinguished by the seven qualities which are the signatures of the seven planets. And these seven modes are themselves derived from combinations of the four fundamental qualities, hot, cold, moist, and dry. The humors of the animal body, blood, lymph, bile, and atrobile, are the materialization of these qualities, and their proportion determines the physical temperament of each individual. That is, it controls the expression of his instincts and influences his psychological reactions. The bilious type is choleric, the lymphatic, lazy, the sanguine, eager, and the atrabilious, anxious. But these temperaments only modify, by their color and intensity, the passions proper to all animal life. Obviously, therefore, passional tendencies, being elementary forces of nature, cannot be suppressed by an act of will. Even the most skillful engineer cannot prevent an underground stream from flowing. He can seal up the spring, but this will only divert its course, and it will reach the surface again through the first fissure that it finds. Passion must be classed with the instincts, but consciousness can make use of it as an instrument in the struggle toward the light.